would also ex- give you a moment of just explanation here. We kind of did a, I did a little end run on our Colossian series as I was thinking about it. I actually had a, asked Betsy this week not to live stream. And then I realized, well, we actually have a few people that are uh, kind of enforced uh, quarantine because of p- uh, potential exposures. And I thought, well, that's probably a bad week to do that in. Uh, so why did I say not the live stream? Well, it, it's maybe it's uh, uh, just a topic we're in Colossians chapter four. If you're familiar, right after you get rid of, after you go past wives and husbands and children and parents, you jump to the topic of bond servants. When you jump to the topic of bond servants, you're really talking about the topic of slavery. Now, that's a little hot button right now in our culture in terms of the whole racial issues, in terms of a lot of uh, critical race theory that's bouncing around in various denominations, creating a lot of division. Uh, there's a lot of things, and, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, things out listening for sound bites on the internet today, and I was just trying not to give the public a sound bite, that somebody would take a snippet, not listen to what all is said, and then actually go on some smear campaign after our church. So that's why I was going to say no, uh, so no, no live stream when we hit that message. So now I'm a little bit in a quandary, because I don't know that life's going to change a whole lot between now and next week. Uh, so whether or not we live stream or not, I guess something we, we can just trust the Lord with that sound biting issue. I don't know. Uh, I have to think about that when I'm praying about that, just to know what the wisdom thing to do. Uh, it's really not that uh, I, at least I hope it has nothing to do with fear. Well, he's just trying to be wise, all right? Uh, so we are looking at, and I thought this, uh, this is a great text for, this, for us for the today. Uh, Truth Project, again, I'll give my own commercial that. I've seen it several times through. I actually was... Uh, with Dr. Tackett on a training thing when, the first, when it first came out. Uh, I'm always encouraged by it. So this morning in Shelburne, we actually watched Truth Project, and then the folks that were there came over to join us for the worship service this morning. Although, uh, for whatever reason, we can't ever seem to sync the two campuses on the same one. We were actually on number eight. You guys are on number seven. You must be slow. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so we were dealing with just the ish, but it really did tie very well. So I was kind of wondering whether or not you were on the same one. Uh, we're going to look at a text in Hebrews, just tying together is where we're going this morning. Back in 1997, uh, Ed Welch wrote a book called When People Are Big and God is Small, Overcoming Peer Pressure, Codependency, and the Fear of Man. Tremendous book. It's one I read uh, several times. I've done some studies through it, uh, different, uh, actually, group studies. Uh, so it is a, is a great read, and it's one that's very important. He hits issues that really were coming into foref- forefront uh, in 1997, that are only all the more uh, here today. In fact, uh, he, 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 wrote, he made this statement uh, in 1997, the rise of psychological needs was inevitable, and he's tying to, if you really want to tie it all the way back, uh, how many of you were taught Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Okay, any of you in secular education were, as of 2005, it's still being taught all over. Maslow actually died in 1970, so he learned better in 1970. Uh, but the hierarchy of needs began in the halls of academia, is where it began. That whole idea of psychological needs began back in the 19... Really, he postulated that all the way back in 1950. So in the halls of academia, it was being kicked around there. Of course, there were others that came out with all the psychological needs that kind of followed little different tracks than Maslow did. But so when uh, Welch says it was inevitable, what the halls of academia entertain eventually come into public sector begins to affect public thinking. And it certainly has. So in fact, he makes the statement, when you exalt the individual and make emotions the pathway to truth, then whatever you feel most strongly about would be considered both good and necessary. Folks, you can just take that one, and if you want to understand modern culture, here you go. What has happened in modern culture? Well, we're no longer a culture of reason, because we're no longer a culture of transcendent truth. We're now a culture of feelings and emotions. And when feelings and emotion become the pathway to truth, then what you feel strongly about is both good and necessary. Thus, we have a culture that actually celebrates moral evil as if it's a triumph as good. And so we find that increasingly taking place because we have lost a sense of transcendent truth, and so morality is largely going to be ruled by the, how things make us feel and what we feel about them. In fact, one of the unpardonable sins of today's culture, and this was written in 97, was to suppress your emotions, or to deny them. And so he called it back then the rise of the cult of self. The cult of self. When you get into the Truth Project, 
Uh, Del Tackett will lay it out as the quest for personal significance. So we want the cult of self makes life surround me, and then what makes me look good and what makes me significant and what others look at. And so we want to come to the greatest expression of self. And in that regard, then we come to a spirituality that is individualized. We each can have our own spirituality. We've not, we've see, we haven't ceased being a religious culture. We've just ceased having a genuine culture that fears God, at least the God of the Bible. And so we have all this individualized spirituality that is being, being suggested. And one of the great part of that then is to suggest that if you, you one of the, say it this way, one of the great sins in today's culture would then be to suggest that your version of God or your beliefs about spirituality are superior to anyone else's. We see that in our culture in a great way. In fact, we see it even in the, so with the administration of the new that's come to office and we had a, an interfaith service um, in the chapel there in D.C. And in that interfaith service, service, prayers were offered to pretty much every God except one, the one true and living God. The God of the Bible is seen too exclusive. He's too bigoted. He's too narrow. And so now we have representatives in our Congress and our Senates, and they're open up prayer, and they're going to all the wannabe gods. And I call it that way, the wannabe gods, because there are no other gods. But people will create their own God after their own image. In fact, Dr. McCune always said it this way in our theology class. Every sinner is born with his make own God kit. You all came into this world as rebels against God with your own version of God that you wanted to create in your own image. And so we live in a world filled with gods that are not God. And thus we have a culture that is offering worship to these gods. And they, one thing that they cannot do and will not do is actually worship the one true and living God. What happens when God becomes small in people's eyes, then the fear of men becomes great. Thus we see shaming becomes a very effective tool of social structure or manipulation. Because if you disappoint the culture around you, you will be shamed or canceled. And no one wants to be shamed or canceled. We don't want to be seen as irrelevant. And so you have many places that claim to be the church and you have a new rise of those who were a liberal, liberal in their theology. When you start denying the Bible, you are liberal in your theology. Who are now rising to prominence in a culture because they're willing to accept every new moral nuance, evil moral nuance, that is being perpetrated by our culture. They don't want to be irrelevant. In fact, their great sin would be found irrelevant. But my suggestion to you is the moment you abandon the God of the Bible, you are irrelevant. Your life is just a vapor. Your ideology is just but for a moment. And that pagan ideology that has taken deep root in our society is going to end by the God of heaven. And so what we need to do as a people of God, because we get pushed, and I would say it this way, we often get, put, I mean, the, the, the increased scrutiny being put on the Christian community may make us all uncomfortable and may have costs that we do not want to pay. But the increased scrutiny on the Christian community in America is a good and healthy thing. Because it's time for those who are Christians to actually move your eyes off of your surrounding culture off of COVID-19, I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned about it. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is the prison house of fear is a prison in which believers are not supposed to live. We have a mission, a commission, from the one true and living God who actually controls all things for his glory, who actually controls whether you and I take our next breath or not who has actually given us commands that we are to follow regardless of the friendly or unfriendly nature of the culture around us. And so we are to engage with our eyes lifted to Christ. That we actually do believe we belong to Christ. I hope you believe that. But it's high time for the church of Jesus Christ to live it. 
We actually belong to him. And so the author of Hebrews put it this way, Therefore, also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not resisted to blood, striving against sin. Folks, we are in grave danger of just growing weary. In fact, if I asked you this morning on the way in, how many of you are tired? Some of you are already sleeping. No, I'm sorry. (laughs) I mean, how many of you are tired? How many of you are exhausted? How many of you just spent this week and all the different issues that came up, whether it was a sleepless night that came or whether you were sick or whether whatever, how many have just spent? I mean, how many of you think you work too many hours in a week? Probably all of us. Probably many of us do. And so we're pushed and we're pushed and we're pushed and we're tired and we're worn down. And here's the thing, when all our eyes are fixed and our energies are spent dealing with the temporal issues of life, we are just worn out. And then we're in danger of being discouraged. When we get discouraged, then we actually really get closed into that inner circle of fear. Because now I'm just discouraged and I got the woe is me and then it's the pity party and everybody wants to invite somebody else to their pity party because we don't want to go there alone. And we run into that danger, but here's the thing, when we begin to grow weary and discouraged, we've taken our eyes off of Jesus. You know there's a cause to that weariness? We're all spending our life, I always like to look at it this way, when Paul would say, uh, to the Corinthians who weren't in his, you know, they weren't in the Paul fan club, at least not all of them. They were kind of divided. Some were Apollos, some were, some were really spiritual. They were in the Jesus fan club. But there were many of them who weren't really in the Paul fan club, and so Paul had brought the gospel to them, ministered to them, and they're in the side of just laboring as Paul. But Paul would say, I very gladly spend and be spent for you, for your soul. And so that text always informs me in this way that the life that I have is temporal, it's ticking, it's fleeting, and I'm spending it. The question is, what am I spending it on? And if I'm spending it only in temporal things and my eyes are really distracted from Jesus and I'm not spending it in ways that honor Him and make Him known, I will be very weary very quickly. You are made for something more than that. You were made for Jesus Christ. When we spend our lives on the things of Christ, it may still be a really difficult existence in life. We won't grow weary. That's when you actually mount up on wings of eagles, right? And you're strengthened. Because grace is always sufficient, and God will strengthen you for the mission, for the task, for what we've been called to do. So we're in danger of growing weary and being discouraged when we get our eyes off Christ. We look to Christ and we're just reminded that at this point, and I love verse 4, you haven't resisted to blood. You're not dead yet. So you're still in the fight, amen? The fight against sin is still waging. You haven't yet died. So keep fighting against sin. Keep striving against sin. You're still in the battle. There's a race to be run. There's a finish line to be crossed. You're not there yet. It's coming. And the only way you're going to stay in the race and finish it is to keep looking unto Jesus. The author and perfecter, the finisher of our faith. So this morning we're going to do something a little unusual in that we're going to go to Psalm 135 and we're going to look to Jesus through Psalm 135. And that's a little unusual in the sense that often, I mean, it's not a messianic psalm. So you'd say, well, if it's a messianic psalm, I get it, but it's not a messianic psalm. It's a psalm that really front ends and ends uh, with the praise and blessings to Yahweh, taking the covenant name of God, God's revealed name to Israel. When God revealed himself to Moses, he said, I am who I am. That's where we get the word Yahweh. I am the God who, I am the one who always has been. 
And it deals with God's covenant fidelity. It deals with the fact He keeps His promises. It deals with this is the one who is Lord. And so how do we look at a text that's all about Yahweh, about His goodness and about His greatness and see Jesus? Well, I think we can because Jesus would even tell the woman at the well when she says, look, we know the Messiah is coming called the Christ, which is going to be the King of Israel, the Anointed One. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He, The language am he is a very specific language tying back to Old Testament promises and he's saying, I'm Yahweh. I am one in the same with Yahweh. In fact, he would tell, I mean, John 10 verse 30 is very clear. I and my Father are one. He would tell his discouraged disciples, listen, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when we look at the declarations on the character of the greatness of Yahweh and the goodness of Yahweh, we are seeing more about the very character and person of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul would tell us in Colossians, in him, in Christ, it pleased the Father, all the fullness of God should dwell bodily. When we see Jesus, we see the Father. When we come to the Old Testament, we look at Yahweh and we find his character and, and, and all his attributes. We're talking about what Jesus is like. So we can come to Psalm 135. And we can ask God to fill our vision with more of Christ. Here's one of the things I know. True worship always involves God's Spirit taking God's Word and illumining your sight. And opening your mind, your heart, to truths about the nature and character of God. You cannot grow spiritually unless your knowledge of God is growing. If you think you're a theological expert, you know all there is to be about God, you are going to be a spiritual zero. Because our God is inexhaustible and He is far greater than anything you've ever imagined or conceived. And the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and helps us understand the character of God that might bring forth our worship and our praise. And so may the Lord today fill our sights with more of the very person and character of God. That our worship might be full. It might be life transformational. We're not just doing church, amen? I mean, I, I, get, I mean, honestly, if all we do is do church and we do busy, we'll all be exhausted at the end of it. But if we actually enter the presence of God and He speaks and our lives are changed, it is the most energizing reality of all. I mean, so we should prepare our hearts for worship. We should be excited by the promises of God. Did God promise to meet with us today? Isn't that a cool promise? Did you get up this morning thinking today I get to go meet with God? Or did you get up this morning going, I hope I'm not late to church? Did you get up this morning and say, you know what, God's going to speak today. We're going to listen. Or did you get up this morning and say, man, I hope pastor has a good story. Maybe I'll stay awake today. I mean, how do we come to church? Are we coming prepared to enter the presence of God? Do we really believe our Bible? Do we really believe what Jesus said? That when we gather, he's here in our midst. He will take his word, bring it to life, and change our lives. Do we really believe that when we come into his presence, he wants to equip us, stir us to a greater love and affection for Jesus so we might go out and actually impact our culture this week rather than just curse it? That there's lost people who desperately need someone to tell them about the love and beauty of Jesus Christ They need to meet people who are excited about what Jesus is doing in their life, not Christians moping around because we're afraid we're going to lose some freedom. We're afraid the idol of comfort that has taken America by storm is going to be taken away from us. Do we love our comfort more than we love Jesus Christ? We do shame on us when we didn't come to worship. May Ichabod be written across the name of every church that worships comfort over Jesus Christ. Because it's not a church, it's a country club. I hope we didn't come to a country club today. We came to hear from God, from His Word, and ask Him to change our lives. This psalm really traces and is rightly connected to the Psalms of Ascent, the Psalms of Ascent which we've been studying. What are the Psalms of Ascent? Well, they would be read by the Israelites as they made their pilgrimages on the various feast days. They would travel up, and they would ultimately, they're coming up to Jerusalem from wherever you're traveling to. 
They would come down and they would come up into Jerusalem. As they traveled, that's why there were psalms of ascent. They're ascending to the temple. They're coming into the presence of God. And they would read these psalms in preparation for entering God's presence and worshiping. Psalm 135 and 136 are both really connected to psalms of ascent as they then portray and really trace the history of God's dealing with Israel as a nation. And so God would bring Israel out of Egypt, out of captivity, and he would bring them into a promised land, give them this promised land, promise them a future. And so they're tracing this history of Israel as they themselves are traveling up to the city of God. And in many ways, it was kind of a microcosm of acting out what God actually did in Israel's history. God's doing that in ours and is going to fulfill it ultimately in a coming kingdom. And so they would travel up and they would celebrate the goodness of God. They would praise God for all that he has already done. And then they would worship in anticipation of all that God has promised to do. And so this morning we want to behold more of Jesus through this psalm. As we look and see the goodness of God and the response to the goodness of God should always be praise. That we would sound forth praise. So praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, you servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of our God. Do you understand the privilege this morning it is to enter the presence of God and not be struck dead? That you and I are really the local church worship today is compared with that which the high priest had an opportunity to enter the Holy of Holies one time of year. One time of year he entered. And then the priesthood, they would rotate through in their responsibilities. They could go to the outer, not in the Holy of Holies. They'd go in the outer court. They would burn the incense, the prayers of God's people. And they longed for that because they were right next to the presence of God. The nearness of God is our good. Aren't you glad Jesus tore the curtain down? And so today we enter into the presence of God, we enter into his house, we have position, we have standing. The goodness of God is the only reason you and I can be here. And we get the privilege of worshiping God, experiencing his nearness, and it is our greatest good, which should always resound in the highest of praise. And so we would sound for that praise, there's a term here. And it does tie to our text in in, uh, Colossians, which we'll we'll do next week, I think. But it says, the servants of the Lord. Now, you and I in American culture think of servants as somebody as a voluntary, I just volunteer myself, I come and serve, and then when I'm tired of it, I leave. Like most servants in the church, you know, most things of service in the church, it's a volunteer capacity. I'll really rattle your cage and just tell you this this morning, that that servant doesn't mean what you think it means. It means slave means one purchased, one whose life no longer belongs to itself. Did you know serving God in his church actually isn't optional for a believer? It's not actually a volunteer thing. God gifted you. Every spiritual gift you have is for his glory. It has actually been put into practice. You're supposed to serve God. And what the church has done through years in American culture, we've tried to create positions of service to give people positions of significance so they will take them. And if it's seen as a significant service, people move towards those because they're seen services. If you serve to be seen, you have had your reward. That's what Jesus said. God's gifts aren't about you. They're about him. Serving God isn't about you. It's about him. And so you servants of the Lord is actually a title. When I tell you it means slave, you think, oh, that's negative, but it's not. It's not meant to be in this context. It's meant to say, listen, somebody loved you enough to buy you. You were a slave. You still were a slave before. You were just a slave of sin. And an Israelite, they're celebrating. Listen, we were in servitude to Egypt, in bondage to them. God rescued us and delivered us and made us his. That's something to celebrate. And the analogy is very clear. God's painting a portrait through his dealing with Israel to remind us of this. Their servitude to a physical nation is just representative of the reality that you and I were all born slaves of sin. And we were under the dominion of sin. It was a cruel dominion and we had no place to go. And we were trapped in sin and we were there serving sin when God had to rescue us to make us his own. 
But when it says you're a slave of God, of the Lord, of Yahweh, that's not a title that is to be run from. It is actually to be embraced because it means God has called me out of servitude to something else, to himself. There's no higher privilege. Because I now belong to the King of glory. I'm his. Bought with precious blood, ultimately we know New Testament. But I am purchased, and now I'm a part of his household, and now I have standing. To be able to stand in the house of, the God, of God is really tying back to Psalm 134, which is a psalm of homecoming. Because Psalm 134 talks about now worshiping the Lord, coming out of the night of darkness of sin into the glorious light of God and standing in the presence of God. And so this standing is a celebration of homecoming. Folks, we're not home yet. The greatest thing that's going to, the negative, most negative thing that's going to happen to you is not that America ceases to be the nation you remember. The greatest tragedy that happens to Christians is when you make this world your home. It's not. We're just passing through. And therefore, we don't have to hold on to things too tightly. Because they're not ours. But we know who they belong to. And everything that he entrusts into our lives, he holds a little loosely, including life itself. Because it's not mine to protect. It is actually mine to defend. It's his to protect. Amen? And so we have the privilege of entering the presence of God. The New Testament's really clear. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? That you is plural, by the way. That's the local church. The body, the local church, is the temple. You have from God, and you are not your own. And you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We're not our own. That, text, that just stands out to me. It's something I, I try to, in fact, uh, when I am really mindful I mean, I, 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 lo- I keep regular Bible reading plans, all that, but one of the things I was challenged on years ago in just a book, of, I think it's called The Greatness of Humility, one of the things that it challenged you to do is every day to get up in the morning and just remind yourself, Lord, this life doesn't belong to me. I'm not my own. I belong to you. And so how I use today needs to be for your glory, not mine. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Isn't that amazing? You want the quest for significance? You know where your significance is found? It's right there. Amen? You want to feel important? You're not, you go out and feel important by people. You know, where some of you are getting, I mean, I don't know who you're rooting for and which, you know, so which team's going to win, but ultimately there's going to be a Super Bowl champion this year. Yay. They'll do it again next year. And the year after that, and the year after that, and then you know what? They might get a lot of rings on their fingers if they get to go a lot of times. And then the guy who has the most rings wins. Wins what? Oh, he might be known for a few years. He might be celebrated for a little while. But you know, if all you have is accolades in this life, you have nothing. Because this life is coming and going. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, we are to glorify God. We are to spend our lives in such a way that brings honor to God. We, 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 the goodness of God is seen in this position that we have, this place of standing and this relationship with God, and that now we have an opportunity to spend our life in ways that actually in my body and my spirit and all that I do, all that I say in my spirit and all that I desire and all my affections should be in such a way that it actually shows that God is of supreme worth, that Jesus Christ matters more to me than anything else. That's what it means. And so we see the praise continuing. Behold the goodness of God. We, we see it in the position uh, or that the, in the position we hold. We also see it uh, in the selection that God has called us to be his own. And he's called us to be a special treasure. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good, amen? The Lord is good even when COVID-19 is ravishing the world, Amen? The Lord is good. He doesn't cease to be good in any point, at any time. When I'm discouraged and overwhelmed and when I feel distressed, 
My eyes are on me, and they're on the circumstances. They're on the ever-change. I mean, two weeks ago, or no, just a week ago, last Saturday, by the end of Saturday, I was spent. I was spent because we were chasing all, was that two, no, it was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, yeah, two weeks ago, because we just found one of our teachers had, been, had gotten COVID, what that meant for our preschool, what we're going to need to do, how do we do all this, the, this regs, those regs, this person tells, this says, this says, and you're chasing all that data down, trying to come to a, lo, a, a conclusion that actually makes sense of how we walk through this right as a ministry. By the time I was done that day, I was tired. And I said, you know what, I spent this whole day chasing regulations. And in the end of that, I need to spend some time with the Lord. <laughs> because I am not going to be refreshed by this world. I'm only going to be refreshed by Christ. The Lord is good. He has never ceased to be good. He cannot cease to be good. And that means he's always doing good. Amen? So when the next time your mouth opens up and the complaint flies out, you just declared God is not good. God, it's not good because life is not now working like I want it to work. Because this didn't work the way I thought it should happen. Because this is happening in the world and that's going to cause this problem, that problem, that problem. You can't anticipate that. You don't even know that. You're not in charge of the world and it's not marching according to your predictions. This is God's world. And the God of heaven is good. And the plans of man are not sovereign. God of heaven is. He rules. He reigns. And he has called the people to himself, chosen Jacob, Israel, for himself. Israel is a special treasure. You could go back in Deuteronomy. You could go back uh, to uh, the text in Exodus 19 and see God choosing Israel, but nothing to do with them. It wasn't because they were more noble. They were more knighty. They were the little at least of all the nations, and God chose them as his people to show forth his glory and his power. New Testament puts it in these terms. Titus, speaking of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There you go, great God and Savior, both titles of Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. You want significance? Found in Jesus Christ. You want the greatest title of all? Beloved. I am loved by God. If I am loved by God, the world may hate me. But I am loved by God, and you can't destroy me. There is one who I need to please, and it's the one who loves me and died for me. He is worthy of all my praise. He is worthy of all my devotion. I've been called out to be his very own child, redeemed, bought for the price of precious blood, and then purified. I'm sorry, but a lot of what is called American Christianity doesn't look like this text. They like, like people that will say they, they know God, they may call themselves a Christian. It's kind of like the Pharisees. Called, they thought they were the religious, uh, I mean, they were the high point of religion in Israel, and they were actually just lost. Folks do notice that when people that have experienced genuine salvation in Christ, their lives are purified, and they are zealous to serve God. They're zealous doers of the good, and the good always looks like what pleases God, not self. Zealous. Zealous to spend and be spent. Zealous to demonstrate the goodness of God. Zealous to serve God, not self. And zealous no matter how hostile a culture around them might be. Amen? Fear a man or fear God. One of the two reign in your heart. When people are big, God is small. When a culture around you and a government seems to crush everything and we become afraid of that or a vaccine or a, 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 pan, a virus. There's the word I was looking for. When a virus is threatening and we all got to be afraid. And I, again, I am not throwing caution to the wind. I'm not saying you don't take steps to protect. But what I am saying is it doesn't determine my life. Because I've actually been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, called to engage in a mission. That mission doesn't change because there's a pandemic in the world. 
if you need to become better students of history, you actually do know that Christians are the ones that actually started the leper colonies and served lepers, right? Do you know they actually went and ministered to lepers, touched, healed, I mean, worked with leprosy. They weren't being cavalier, but they were willing to get sick themselves to help others. The Christians in China when, China, when Mao crushed down on China and pushed out religion, tried to make it an atheistic le- nation, you know where the Christians went? They went to the hospitals. They went to all the infirmaries. They went to the sick, and they prayed with them, and they nourished them, and they helped them back to health. That's where they went. They went to the poor and despised and the ostracized of their society, and they took the gospel there and watched the gospel thrive. You know what we do? We move churches into a new economic community and we target those who have economic means in America. So we build churches of comfort and pleasure rather than churches of ministry of grace. One of the most life-changing ministries that I am aware of, I mean, my friend John Klaus is here. He runs a ministry called Get Out the Bus. You know what they do every week? They go out in Tulsa, Oklahoma to the streets. They pick up hookers. They pick up drug addicts. They pick up people walking the street, the homeless. And they minister grace, and they help them. For those that really want to get their lives turned around, they connect them to other ministries that are directly connected to help them to get their lives turned around. You know what they see almost every week? They have opportunities to sow the gospel, and they're seeing lives changed and people rescued from a life of sin. You know what we do? We go to the rich seem to have everything in their life going right and we try to tell them why their life's backwards and they laugh at you and they tell you they don't need your Jesus because we think they'll make better church members Peter tells us this you're a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him He's redeemed us to be his own people, that we would make his worth known, his praises known. That obviously is a great applicational question, but we keep moving. We're to behold the greatness of God and bow in humility. For I know the Lord is great. Great statement. The question is, do you make that with absolute conviction? The Lord is great. Not America's great. Not the dollar is great. Not my job is great. The Lord is great. He's the worthy one. He is great, and He is the Lord above all gods, and He's not saying there are any other gods. He's really pointing to a concession of how depraved humanity is. Humanity sets up their would-be gods, but there are no gods. In fact, He sets up this statement of the greatness of God with seven statements that is set in contrast with the impotence of the gods of the world in seven statements. Why seven? Because seven, biblically, is always a number of completion. God created the world in six days. On the seventh, he rested. The seventh day, the day of completion. And and at the end of, on the seventh day, God could say of his creation that it is good, is all I intended to be. And so when the psalmist is saying God is great, he follows with seven statements about the greatness of God. He's saying God is as great as anything could be great. There is, he is the completion of greatness. He is the perfection of greatness. There is no one greater. There could be nothing greater than the God, than Yahweh, than the God of heaven. He is great. He alone is great. And all the rest of the would-be gods of the world are not gods at all, and they are not great. How do you measure greatness? God's greatness is measured simply. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Now, you and I like to think that about ourselves. We like to think we're in charge, that we're the masters of our own faith, that we live life by our own standard, by our own charge. We're going to do it my way. I mean, we sing songs about it in our culture, don't we? We celebrate that person as a rugged individualist, and he did it might. He pirated his way. He, he made his own way. He did it. He built his own fortune, his own company, his own whatever. He did it on his own lever. Do you know that's not true about any person on this world? I mean, Nebuchadnezzar thought that once. Look at this great Babylon I built. Do you know where Nebuchadnezzar went next? Into a field. Came to a tree to eat grass for seven years. Man, there's some people I'd love to see that happen to. (laughs) 
I mean, there's just the reality. I mean, there's so much we want to celebrate of ourselves. We want to think we did this. We're significant. We do what we want. No, you don't. You live in the world that is God created. It is his world, and it is marching according to his order. And when you want to fly in the face of that, friend, you will be crushed by the God of heaven. Note the extensiveness of God's sovereignty over all of creation, his extensiveness of his greatness in heaven and in earth. The seas and the deep places, he causes the vapors to ascend. He makes the light and he brings the rain. I mean, remember the disciples, I didn't put that text there. The disciples, they were a little despondent. Jesus in the boat asleep. The winds and the waves come, it's crashing, and he, they run to Jesus and they're like, Get up, we're dying here. Don't you care we're perishing? And Jesus says, what is wrong with you? You have little faith. Who do you really think I am? Do you think your life is subject to a storm? Do you think that is as simple as life is? That the storm came and I don't know about it and your life is now going to be snuffed out and I don't care? Is that all you think about me? And Jesus simply speaks and the storm stops. And they're asking, what kind of man is this? Well, he's not a man. They already know that. But their view of who God is is still so diminished even though they had a good theological backdrop. When life's storm came and life was threatened, they were afraid. And they didn't believe God cared. Describes a lot of people I meet right now. Describes a whole lot of people who have a good theological vocabulary. But they really are afraid. And they somehow aren't sure that God cares. And Jesus says, do you think so little of me? That your life is subject to the whims of a storm or a virus or anything else? Who do you really think controls your next breath? The one who controls all things? Or the doctor that's going to give you a medicine to make you better? Or the government that's going to help you with a better economy? Who do we think is great? Behold the greatness of God. Bow in humility. Behold the compassion of God. And be encouraged. I wish there was such a thing as, well, maybe I shouldn't say it that way because there are things out there that people will tell you you can take and encourage you. I wish there was an encouragement pill or candy. Let's just make it a candy because this pill is a medicine and somebody's going to tell you, we have that. This will make you happy. Yeah, what is it going to do after that? Okay, I'm not talking about happiness. I am talking about genuine encouragement. You know, encourage, it actually brings the word in that it's all about, right? To be encouraged is to be filled with courage. You know, it takes courage to trust and obey. In fact, the one that you actually trust and obey is the one that you believe is all-powerful. And so he's highlighting God's power. He's going to show it in his deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. He's going to show it in God's deliverance of, of the promised land to Israel. And then he's going to point forward to the fact that God's going to deliver his people into a kingdom forever. Amen? And so here's the compassion of God. So God de- de- vanquishes the enemies of God's people. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt. He, 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 of both man and beast, he sent signs and wonders in the midst of Egypt on Pharaoh. I mean, here's just, and, and this is a callback. This is one of those things calling you back to the, to the whole event of the Exodus and causing you to go all the way back to when, when Moses walked into Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Yahweh commands it. And Pharaoh's question is, who is Yahweh? Isn't that what so many people in your culture, I mean, you're telling people what God says and God's word, and they want to know, well, I, I don't really believe in God. I, who is your God? That's a really bad question. Because you really don't want God to show you. Not like this. 
But God shows Pharaoh, and he shows the pagan world, and he does it in a display, really, of all the different gods of Egypt, and every plague and every wonder was all designed to say, there is no other God than me. I am the one true and living God who reigns over all things. All things obey me. Including the greatest power then in the known world who saw himself as a God himself had to be completely humiliated by the God of heaven and was. So when you see evil rising to power, and we do, we need to remember that evil as it rises to power rises and falls according to the will of the sovereign God who will humble man's rebellion and arrogance and will cause his name to be honored in the world. He defeated many nations, slew mighty kings. Folks, there are no mighty kings in this world. We need to be, I'm more afraid of this nation, that nation. We may be over, soon overcome by such and such. We may soon be a satellite nation of such and such country. You can just fill in your blanks, okay? Stop reading it, please. Read your Bible. Trust the God of heaven and say, what does God have me to do? We're to serve Jesus Christ, make him known, amen? The world's in God's hands, not ours, not the government's hands, not in the army's hands. It's not going to be the next missile or the next whatever is going to determine it. The God of heaven rules over all. And our part is to trust and obey. Trust him, do what he calls us to do. He takes care of the enemies. He, he humbles them, he slays them. And ultimately he does this. As, as the evil man prospers and he gathers all the stuff, you know what God does? He takes all that stuff and he gives it to his people. Isn't that fun? Do you know evil never wins? You say, well, it might seem like it right now. Evil never wins. God didn't get off his throne. He is good and doing good, Amen. As the children of God, we're called to live out the reality. Our God is good. He is sovereign. He rules over all the nations. And evil may prosper at a time, but just remember, to you and us, it seems like a long time. But it's nothing in eternity. It's just a blip on the radar when evil seems to win. And as it seems to win, just remember this, God's still accomplishing all of his good purposes in the lives of his children. And eventually, all the, quote, things the world accumulates to say, look how powerful you are. God says, look, I gave it to you. I'll take it back now. Evil doesn't win. God defeats the enemies of God's people. He humbles them. He will destroy human rebellion. And then he will show forth his compassion on his children forever and ever. Oh, Lord, your name endures forever. Your fame throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge. And this isn't like the kind of judgment where he's going to come in and put condemnation. This is the kind of judgment that's a vindication. God is for his people. Amen? You're not vindicated based on what you have done. You're vindicated based on who Jesus Christ is. That's why we're his slaves. We belong to him. We've been bought, purchased. My acceptance into God's presence has never been a performance-based reality. If it was a performance-based reality, I would be judged and condemned with the rest of the world that thinks their performances is what makes them significant. It thinks what their accomplishments are, the things they own, what gives them significance, but it makes them irrelevant. What gives you significance is being a child of the king of glory, being loved by the God of heaven. That makes you a part of his treasured possession, meaning he looks out for you every day, amen? And whatever suffering might come as a part of life in a fallen world, it still is the Bible teaches us as a good gift from his hand. That's a hard one. Because none of us like suffering. None of us like to be reminded of how temporal this world, how broken it is, how it's filled with, with, with sickness and brokenness. We don't like to experience it, but it is a part of a broken world that will yield itself up into glory forever. Folks, you have glory coming, amen? And whatever the level of difficulty you go through today, can I promise you this? You know this to be true if you're a child of God. God didn't leave you. He didn't forsake you. He's right there with you. He's carrying you through. His grace will be sufficient. He loves you. That has not stopped. He will walk through that trial with you. And at the end of that trial's glory forever. Don't get despondent. Don't get discouraged. Your God reigns for your good. And he is compassionate, filled with compassion. Because of the day I stand before him, it's not going to be the list of, oh, Billy, you did that one. That was good. That one was bad. That was good. You did more good than bad. You can come in. It's not going to be like that at all. The day I enter his presence, it's going to be you're welcomed as my child because I've loved you and my son died for you and I purchased you. You're my treasured possession. It's like the greatest family reunion ever. Son, you've come home. 
Welcome home. But have compassion on those he's bought to be his own treasured children. Folks, you want to be significant? You find it in Jesus. When he's your Lord, you have every reason to live. When he's your not, you're just dying every day. Because only when Jesus is Lord are you alive. Then you live for what really matters. Behold the impotence of the world's gods, everything the world worships. The idols, really, is just the images, and it doesn't demand a literal idol. I know during, I mean, historically, contextually, you're dealing with the fact that people have forever built their idols. They still do today. They still bow to various things built that they're supposed to represent their spirituality, their God, and, and, and they do it in different ways. They may have a statue. They may have some vestment cloak. They may have something hung around their neck. They may have some sign in their building. They may have some image that they'll put out. But they'll have all kinds of things that are to represent their spirituality that they fall to and they worship. Or they just worship their own imagination as they imagine life to be. And it still is the images of a fallen human heart. It is just the works of men. But they have no life. They don't speak. They may be built to look like an idol, but they can't speak. They can't see. They can't hear. They have no breath. There's no life in them. And so here's the God of heaven saying, remember who I am. I am the one alone who is great. I am completely great. The gods of the world, they're not great at all. There's just the imagination of a human heart fallen, looking for something to worship to give them significance. Worship is not about making us significant. It's about making him significant. Amen? And when your religion's about making you significant or important, you discover yourself, I mean, you can go to Scientology. I told you a little bit about that. That was all, that's really a form of Maslow's self-discovery because you're going to find out you're an eternal spirit and you can become powerful and you can control life. You know what that religion's all about? You! You can jump into most cults and it's all about you becoming powerful, you becoming more dominant, you getting this and you having that. If it's all about you, then you will have had your reward and whatever praise you get from men. But you will find the condemnation of an eternal God who will not bow to your would-be God. And the greatest condemnation of this text is simply the frightening reality and the statement that God makes that those who worship that way Those who make them and trust them are going to be just like them. Which means what? Without life. Forever. Only when Jesus is Lord do you have life. And then we see the right response when we behold Jesus through the word. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi, you who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. So what does it mean? And I'll just illustrate it this way so you can read. So I don't think the camera will go that far, so I better stay here. Jonathan, if I say, Jonathan, may the Lord bless you. So if Jonathan can shake my hand, this COVID, you ever roll up, I don't know if that's just sorry. I'll repent later, sorry, but uh, Now, if I say, Lord bless you, Jonathan, what am I asking God to do? This is participatory, I know. I usually do all the talking. I'll let you this time. Somebody, help me out. What does it mean? I say, Lord bless you, Jonathan. What am I asking God to do? Okay. In order for Jonathan to get a blessing, what does God need to know? If I'm asking God to bless, what am I asking him? I'm asking God to do something good for him or bad? good, which would be connected to his need. Okay, now typically when somebody says, Lord bless you, or God bless you, which, you know, bless you, which we shorthand for God bless you when people sneeze, right? Right. Um, Which is make you better. That was really historically what we were meaning by that. Um, So, but when we're asking God to bless, we're really saying, God, you know the need. Now meet the need that you know exists. Because that will be a blessing to that person. Okay, so now we may take it when somebody says bless me or I, re- I do my birthday thing and I blow out my candles and we want a blessing, we just want what we want. That's not a blessing. <laughs> it is not a blessing to get what you want because most of the time what we want is not good. 
Have you ever noticed in life that most of your plans don't work out the way you thought they would? I mean, it just doesn't, because you and I plan, we make our plans, but ultimately our steps are determined by chance. No, by the Lord, who's sovereign over all. And so if I'm asking for blessing on somebody, I'm asking God, you know their need, now meet it. And you know their real need. So when we bless the Lord, God has no needs. What do we mean? If we're going to bless the Lord. We are, we're, we're not asking God what his needs are. He has none. What we're called to do is then look at who God is. Remember all of his attributes, his goodness, his greatness, everything that's been celebrated in this psalm. Look at who God is. Remember all he has done and then respond with worship because that blesses the Lord. What is a blessing? It's to respond appropriately to who he is. What does that look like? It looks like worship. It looks like praise. It looks like song that brings delight. Don't you? I, I mean, you know, it, it, it's earlier in the text, it's about when we sing praises that are delight, it brings delight to worship with God's people. And, and when we come with a heart filled to worship in anticipation of what God's going to do and meet with us, then we lift our voices. I don't know about you, but I long to see. You know, I, I know we, you know, we're, we have people need to be at home and all the different things. But I long to be in a, where there's no restrictions, and I would love to just see, like, every seat in the house full, wouldn't you? I mean, we've had it a few times, different programs at times. Every seat in the house full, then you open up congregational singing. It's an altogether different experience, isn't it? All of a sudden, the, I mean, the room just resonates with voices sounding forth the praise of God. It's a little foretaste of heaven, folks. Do you know every Sunday we're getting a little foretaste of heaven? We're entering the presence of God with the people of God to sound forth his praise and worship God, to hear from God. It is a little foretaste of heaven. You're saying, you're not that good a preacher, Pastor. No, it's not right. I understand. It isn't about the preacher, honestly. It's about God who is here, isn't it? And I'm glad. Because if it was about me, then it would, it, it would be altogether wrong. It's never about the preacher. It's really not about how good a voice we have. I mean, I, I love special music. I love to hear beautiful voices sing. But ultimately, it really isn't about that. It is about the people who love God sounding forth his praise together. It's a delightful experience. Uh, I mean, I, I enjoy going to conferences, especially like going to pastors' conferences, because you know what? They most of the time... Uh, are, I mean, they all have usually pretty good voices, not necessarily singing voices, but they have big voices. They speak all the time. And you get a room full of preachers, you get a thousand preachers in a room and they all lift up their voices to sing, that room resonates with sound. And there's people who've given their lives to studying God's word. You know what? There's just a depth to that singing that I cannot explain. But it's a little taste of heaven. Just a little taste of heaven. And so we lift our eyes and we behold more of the glory of God and we are changed, Paul says, from one degree of glory to another. And when we lift our eyes off of the things of this world and we put them on Christ, then we stop being discouraged. We stop being despondent. And then maybe we will not grow weary in well-doing. Our God is good. Our God is great. And as we behold more of the goodness of God, and we run to God. Last illustration, we close. Any of you have children that were, got afraid at night, like they were afraid of the dark? Any of you have, maybe you were the child that's afraid of the dark, all right? So you're the, so what do children typically, when they're afraid of the dark, what do they do? They get up and they run where? They go to their parents, Right? Now, some of you lock them in your room, and you do, I'm just, you know, real shame. No. They want to run, but where do they want to go? They want to crawl in. They want to get next to their parent. You know what? When they crawl in that bed, and they get next to you, and they snuggle up, all of a sudden, they're no longer afraid. Folks, in the middle of your fear, your discouragement, and being tired, there's one place you're supposed to run. You can always run to Jesus. He is strong and kind. 
And there you will find rest for your soul. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving sinners like us. Thank you for its word, its power, its authority. And Lord, we do ask that you'll help us to think biblically, act biblically, live by faith, not by sight. Lord, that we would run to you. That our eyes would be open through your word to behold more of your goodness, more of your greatness. That it would instill us, encourage our hearts, humble us. Help us to live as those bought with a price that's not about us. It really is about you. But Lord, yet in being about you, you have, you love us. You walk with us. You'll always be with us. You provide us grace, sufficient wisdom when we, as we call and ask. And so Lord, we're not left alone. We're not irrelevant. We're actually a treasured possession of the God of heaven. We're your children. We're your slaves who've been bought with a price. We belong to you. And we're beloved. And we're family. And you're a father. So all of that is true. And so may we run to you in the midst of the discouragement and the despondency that we experience in this world, in the midst of being tired. Lord, may we redeem the time and we buy up the opportunities. And Lord, there's challenges, there's difficulties. We deal with the virus, we deal with people afraid, we deal with our own fears, we deal with the brokenness of life and in our own bodies and all of that. But Lord, we need wisdom. Lord, we need opportunity and we need to pray for it and we need to step through it and step in filled with courage to minister the gospel to people who have no hope. Lord, help us to find ways to do that. That you might draw men and women, boys and girls to yourself. That you might receive the glory, the worship of which you are worthy. Lord, help us not just to come and to sit and to hear. Lord, help us to come and to lift our hearts in praise and adoration and receive your word that transforms our life and enables us to engage our culture with the gospel in ways that make your glory known. Father, you can do that because you are great and you are good. Help us come to you, Father. Be strengthened by grace. We might better represent you into a culture that's steeped in darkness and buy up every opportunity you give us to be tools or instruments of redemption in the lives of perishing people. And we'll give you the glory. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.